Welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast channel for sustainable procurement. We hope you like what you hear. Please go to www.iso2400.org for more information and free resources, such as articles, case studies, videos, a self-assessment against the standard, and much, much more. Welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your Sustainable Procurement Podcast. I'm Sean McCarthy, Director of Action Sustainability Community Interest Company. I'm delighted to introduce Luca today from the United States, who's going to talk to us first about his college project during lockdown, which has actually led to a very significant business in the American healthcare sector. I hope you enjoy it. So welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast channel for all things sustainable procurement. I'm Sean McCarthy. I'm a director of Action Sustainability Community Interest Company, and I'm delighted to welcome Luca from the USA. Welcome, Luca. Well, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you very much. And hopefully I can add some color and perspective from, you know, just across the pond. So great, Luca. Tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us about how, how you got to where you are today. And I understand you're doing some really exciting things in healthcare procurement that can hopefully lead us to a more sustainable outcome. So uh, do tell us what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a 25-year-old entrepreneur. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Grapevine. And yeah, Grapevine is a procurement platform and marketplace or market cloud for healthcare practices and healthcare businesses to sustainably source the supplies they already buy just at a significantly cheaper price. And while doing that, you know, reducing their carbon emissions. Okay. So how does it work? Tell us about it. Uh, Absolutely. So part, I guess the first thing that people do is it's totally free to use for healthcare businesses. They sign up and after signing up, we sort of prompt them to link their suppliers. So the suppliers they already work with, right? They're going to put in their sort of McKesson, Henry Shine, Staples, different accounts of the suppliers that they already buy from. And when they do that, we instantly sort of sync in all the products they can buy from all their various suppliers. So they no longer need to dance between different procurement portals or different shopping centers, different websites, right? McKesson's website, Henry Shine's website, Medline's website. They can instead sort of shop everything in one place. And that place is, you know, Grapevine. So Grapevine is their procurement platform in that sense. And when they, you know, start shopping and they add to cart, you know, on a a product that they've always bought, let's say these band-aids from McKesson and McKesson's, you know, our biggest, biggest supplier in the United States, they do over $300 billion of sales revenue in the, in the healthcare supply chain space. And when they add a card on the band-aids they've always bought from McKesson, we actually run queries in the background and it's in a split second where we see, does that same product exist in their network of suppliers, meaning like the same manufacturer number, same FDA regulations and compliance, same quality, same exact product, just maybe under a different brand name, you know, different packaging, or, you know, maybe it's the same exact product, even in its brand and it's, and it's everything in its packaging. And as we run that query, they click add to cart and a pop-up just simply appears, right? The conclusions of our findings that says, hey, this product exists from one of your other suppliers at one-tenth the cost. And very often it is one-tenth the cost. And cost, you know, is a, a good indicator of supply chain efficiency because things get more costly as they're redundantly shipped over and over again to middlemen and other middlemen and people sort of packing their things. I can talk more about the sustainability aspect, but I want to give you a good idea of how we sort of drive savings for these healthcare businesses. Well, well that's fantastic, isn't it? Because obviously it, customers need to save money. If you're going to get them hooked into sustainability, there has to be a good business case for doing it. And, you know, uh, I, I always say, you know, if, if you sustainability shouldn't cost you more, but that procurement will. Uh, and clearly, you know, having this sort of wealth of information mm-hmm. about different products and their, their costs, and if that's that's available by some technical magic that I won't even pretend to understand, um, that's that's got to be a, a benefit to the user. So, yeah, that sounds fantastic. And if it really is a tenth of the cost, then you can imagine what, what the benefits may be. So how does that link into the sustainability agenda? What, what happens there in, in terms of the sustainability of a product? Yeah, I guess before jumping into sort of, I guess, how we make things sustainable, could I Mm. tell you uh, an anecdote or a story about the the painful 
inefficiencies that just drain, you know, <laughs> or just pump carbon into the atmosphere that I've experienced firsthand. We, so a few years back, I, I got involved in healthcare supply chain back in spring 2020. I was a junior in college at the University of Pennsylvania, and I was actually studying in a renewable energy sustainability program called Viper um, at UPenn, and it's the Bachelor's Integrated Program for Energy Research. So it was all about sustainability, renewables, um, and that was really my, my core focus. Still is a huge passion of mine, but COVID really called us, me and my friends, my roommates, into getting involved in healthcare supply chains. Our first sort of footing in, the, in this space was us simply looking at import data. In the United States, we have access to all of the import records, who shipped it into the United States, who received it in the United States. So we looked at these import data records, found who was actually successfully importing supplies uh, when the big suppliers were failing, and we handed off the contact information, those importers, to frontline workers that we knew and that we cared about. That was it. We didn't have a business in mind and we were doing this from our dorm room because classes were stalled and we were bored and wanted to help. A few weeks later, I get a call from McKesson, that $330 billion distribution dinosaur I mentioned before. And they call me and they say they want to issue me a PO. I didn't know what a PO was. Apparently it's a purchase order for over a million masks. And I was shocked. I'm a kid in my dorm room, had any experience, didn't know what they were talking about. I got on, you know, online, made a company pretty quick, and we started working and primarily selling to, you know, McKesson, huge volumes of different products. And as we did that, we would, to conceal and protect, you know, the value of, of, of us in the supply chain, to conceal and protect the sources from which we were buying, we would purchase those supplies from the various importers. We would stick them into a warehouse of our own. We would then ship them to McKesson, who would then take it into their warehouse and ship it to the customer, right? And I, I, I started seeing the same product. So I never sold anything, you know, to my mom. My mom was a nurse practitioner at the time and she bought from a cousin. But my, I started asking my mom, hey, what are you buying these products for, by the way? Because we're like one of the few suppliers who's able to provide McKesson with masks at the time. And she's like, I forget the number, but she's telling me it's something like a dollar a mask. And I almost crapped my pants because we were buying them for like three cents a mask. I like, couldn't believe it. Right. And part of that, and then you look at McKesson, they publish these, you know, the annual reports and they're only making a 1% profit margin. And there's a lot that can go into that, but I was shocked by that. And you, I was trying to justify it to myself, how they could be basically barely making money when marking something up 30 times in some cases. And when we really dug into the details, we start looking at a lot of these sort of low cost items and a lot of the cost that gets sort of built in embodied in the end user's final price is the cost of logistics, right? Every time you ship something, especially in these medical supply spaces, and it depends on the product itself, that product is going to go up in sales price to net profit by anywhere from 20% to, you know, 50% or even a hundred percent, right? If you're shipping giant jugs of sterile or distilled water, most of the cost is shipping itself. It's not really the cost of manufactured goods. So to tell you sort of where it all went wrong with sustainability in our first sort of stab at supply chain and what where we were a huge part of the problem is we were buying things sometimes from you know someone who was actually a reseller and there was four or five six shipments each one sort of getting embodied into the cost of the product that the end user would pay and growing the cost of the product by you know five times ten times in some cases just to cover the costs of sort of shipping transportation logistics and warehousing in the US, you know, transportation is about 10% of our total emissions, right? That's a that's a crazy number. And we take it from sort of shipping it five times and we cut that down by 80% as far as the number of shipping nodes in our supply chain. We like to go direct from importer to end user. We don't like to have these sort of stops, extra shipments, redundancies that cost the end user money and also cost our planet carbon. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense uh, to, you know, re reduce the shipping. Do you actually, do you track the carbon footprint of these products or have you not got that far yet? We don't go that far yet, but I would really like to. And there's increasing sort of like tax benefits, right, to, to healthcare businesses that are shopping, you know, sustainably and whatnot. So it's to the advantage of our customers at the end of the day to to start tracking that in the near term future. So, so this is a business that's grown out of COVID actually. It's, it's actually the, the COVID crisis 
pretty much that's driven you to do what you do. And, and obviously, you know, healthcare providers around the world had, had similar problems with getting the, uh, particularly the PPE that they needed. Totally, totally sort of inspired by and called to action by the COVID and, and pandemic. And things have changed a lot since. We're no longer bringing things into a warehouse. We no longer sell any supplies, but we do still try to sort of solve the problems that we became aware of through our COVID experiences. And we would not be in the healthcare supply chain if it were not for COVID. So now you want, is it like a brokerage service then rather than, than buying and selling supplies now? Is well, now it's... Yeah, it's that procurement platform sort of that I mentioned, right? So they just sort of optimize costs from the network of vendors from whom they already buy. That's a huge part of it. And then we've also got a, a market cloud or marketplace, which is basically us introducing them to several hundred small specialty importers. So the people that are importing things, the same people that we were looking up and tracking way back from our college dorm rooms. <laughs> You know, but we actually plug them into this platform and connect them to vendors. And often, more often than not, those suppliers actually supply McKesson, right? They still supply McKesson this day. So more than 60% of the supplies that McKesson sells or Henry Schein sells are actually imported by another party, branded by another party and sold by that supplier directly. So it's just about connecting the dots there. So we combine that market marketplace. We don't hold the inventory, you know, the network of new, smaller specialty importers direct to the healthcare customers while optimizing sort of costs and reducing emissions across their existing vendor network through procurement. So, so what sort of range of products do you cover? I mean, you, you've mentioned, I, I guess what I would say healthcare consumables, things like band-aids and masks and that sort of thing. But do you go further? Are you looking at surgical instruments or other type of sort of more sophisticated health healthcare products? Yeah. Yeah. We cover every, we started in a, uh, you know, the COVID related stuff and the consumables mm, that, yeah. were, that were hard to find. But we, we now service all sort of surgical supplies, even, you know, like durable medical equipment is what we call it. And like, you know, hardware and tables, surgical tables and the light fixtures and whatnot and vacuum systems and all, all sorts of things, even some implants for cardiovascular systems and surgeries. And we're now starting to, and we're not rushing into it by any means, because there's a lot of different compliance stuff and whatnot but we're now actually starting to experiment with some drugs and pharmaceuticals because okay. i was going to ask how you deal with like compliance for specifications and i know we have a, a huge scandal in the uk about some gowns that we bought during covid from turkey or somewhere and they didn't comply with the, the specification that, that was required where does that responsibility sit in terms of making sure that you're getting the right stuff to the end user that complies with the requirement. Yeah. So when it comes to linking their own suppliers, right, that's sort of quality control that they are obligated to do on their own. If they bring us an unqualified supplier that they've been working with for 10 years, you know, we don't take the measure of, of sort of investigating and, and notifying them of that. Yeah. But when it comes to our marketplace or that network of a few hundred different specialty suppliers that we do introduce to each of our, you know, healthcare businesses that shop mm -hmm. on Grapevine, all of those were cross-referencing various databases before they ever see or get introduced to a single customer. So we're checking, you know, the open source API or access points for, you know, for the FDA regulatory, they've, in, the FDA publishes like the licenses for every single product and every single supplier of every single product that, you know, is used or approved to, to be used in the US. So we basically overlay that data with the import data to find FDA sort of verified or stamp of approval uh, suppliers who are importing into the United States. And then we connect those people on Grapevine uh, to the customer base. So the quality control is, is by the FDA? Yeah, the quality control is by the FDA. And there's other third party testing, you know, regulatory agencies that we've even worked with ourselves to get products sort of tested and qualified for, for different degrees of use. Wow. Can I ask you, I mean, sustainability obviously isn't just about carbon. There are issues around waste and circularity. Obviously, with consumable disposable products, uh, are you doing anything in the area of recyclable or usable products, that type of thing? So we've donated a ton of supplies to the Afia Foundation, which 
as far as recycling medical supplies in the United States, it's it's not really allowed from what I understand, but they are able to use those supplies in different parts of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So we work with the Afia Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in New York City where we are. And when hospitals or, you know, different healthcare businesses have overstock of supplies that's expiring, they'll basically dump it off to Afia and Afia will make sure it gets delivered to different parts of the world that can use those supplies. So that's something that we're pretty proud of. We've donated a fair bit of supplies there. I've also got a dream related to expiring supplies and sort of redirecting things, not necessarily to other parts of the world, because as we know, shipping and transportation cost something, mm -hmm. but to local local smaller businesses that can use those supplies before they expire, right? So you can theoretically, I mean, yeah, the, the idea is Grapevine not only has built out like this procurement platform, but we also have an inventory management system that notifies you when your supplies are expiring. We don't do much about that today, but what we'd like to do is have people take their expiring supplies, list it onto a storefront of their own, and circulate that back into the ecosystem of healthcare businesses, specifically local healthcare businesses that maybe do need this drug and they would buy it at whatever. I mean, what would you sell these supplies? You're otherwise going to throw them out or donate them. Like what would you sell those supplies at? I'm sure they would sell them at a fraction of the price and people have a need to, to buy supplies that are expiring in a month or two and will pay some amount for it. But they'll be able to get a discount and we'll be able to prevent the sort of waste that, that does end up happening. Right? Yeah, that's a product that would either otherwise end up in landfill because it's expiring. Yeah, that's a fantastic yeah. notion. Obviously not doing it yet, but what, what a brilliant idea. Um, we've, got, we've got the technical capabilities to do it right yeah. now. Like uh, the software is actually all built for it. It's, it's just harder than you think to turn a healthcare business into a functionally a reseller of supplies. They yeah. don't know how to deal with it. They don't want to deal with it. So... It's more a, a strategy and rollout issue that we're that we're. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, as you say, that that's not their core business, is it? They, you know, their core exactly. business obviously is is people's health and, and looking after people. Thanks very much, Luca, for describing your fascinating journey and how you've used um, software and big data to improve the way the USA procures healthcare consumables. I do hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our podcast on sense and sustainability. Please listen out for more episodes. For more information, learning resources, tools, and much more on sustainable procurement, go to www.iso2400.org.